So do you remember how before we learned how to add fractions, we had to get like units? So if we had 2 over x plus 3 over x, 1 over x happens to be the common unit. So we can say 2 plus 3, so it'll be 5 over x. The next one would be 8 over 2x plus 3, because 1 over 2x plus 3 is the common unit. So a natural question to ask would be, can we use our previous knowledge and address these kind of problems? So 3x over 4x plus 3 plus 2x plus 1 over x plus 2. They do not have like units right now. So how can we create equivalent fractions and make use of our multiplication? That's what we're going to study next. So suppose I asked you to add these fractions. Remember, before we showed you, unless you make common denominator, we cannot add fractions. So to make common denominator, then we're going to use equivalent fractions. So you have this denominator and this denominator. And before we saw that unless you multiply numerator denominator using equivalent fractions so that they both have the same denominator, we cannot really add. So we're saying take this denominator, multiply numerator denominator of this term by it, take this fraction, multiply top and bottom by this denominator x. Now to do, now they both have the same denominator, so all we have to do now is, this is the 2x, use multiplication, distributes over addition, 4 times 3 is 12, and 4 times 4x is 16x, and then add like terms. So we have 18x plus 12 divided by this denominator. And so that would be how you add fractions. So when you learn a new concept, you see if we can now solve a problem from before that perhaps we were stuck on. All right, try this one on your own. I'll give you a few moments. Remember, these are two different denominators, right? So remember what we said. So this one would have to have 1 plus a in it, and this one would have to have 3 plus a in it. So as long as you keep equivalent fractions, you're able to do that. So now go ahead and multiply. This would be good practice for you. Use a distributive property. 1 times 1 is 1. 1 times a is a. 2 times 3 is 6. 2 times a is 2a. Now I have like terms. Go ahead. So the final answer would be 7 plus 3a divided by 1 plus a times 3 plus a. This is very, very important and is going to really, really help if you go step by step and understand all the steps. So when you have common denominator, then we can continue uh, adding the numerators. But until unless you have common denominator, you cannot add fractions whether they are algebraic fractions or numeric fractions. All right, we'll pause the video here, do this problem on your own, and then check your answer. So to make equivalent fractions, first one gets multiplied by 2x plus 3, and the second one gets multiplied by 2 plus x. Okay, so this one needs the 2x plus 3, this one needs 2 plus x, and then use distributive property and multiply. Add like terms, and that's your answer. Okay, do that one on your own now. Pause the video. So again, same thing. Multiply first fraction by x plus 2 on numerator denominator, and second one by 3 plus 4x, and then use distributive property of multiplication over addition, and then add like terms, just like you've been doing before. And then add like terms. Remember now, here we had 2x times 3, 6x, 2x times 4x, 8x squared, because x times x. 1 times 3 is 3, 1 times 4x is 4x. And now add like terms. So 3x squared and 8x squared will give me 11x squared. 6x plus 6x, 12x plus 4x will give me 16x, and then 3 will be as is 3. So, so far we've looked at addition and multiplication. Now we'll focus on uh, subtraction of counting number and whole numbers, and then see how it works for subtracting other objects as well.
So let's start with something simple. We have seven apples and we want to take away four apples. So in kindergarten or first grade or second grade, wherever you learned it, you're probably going to ask to be counting down four from seven. So take away four apples. So here's first apple gone, second apple gone, third apple gone, fourth apple gone. We're left with three apples. <clears throat> Another way sometimes people ask you to subtract is to count down from seven. So it would be six, five, four, three. And that's how you count down four from seven. All right, so seven minus four apples equals three apples. Before we can do more subtraction, let's just talk about some additional concepts that will aid us in the subtraction process. Two objects, A and B, are called additive inverses of each other if and only if their sum is the additive identity. In this particular case where we're working with mathematical objects where zero is our additive identity, then if the addition of the two objects give us additive identity of zero, then A and B are going to be additive inverses. A is additive inverse of negative A, and negative A is additive inverse of A, okay? Because they added together give you zero. So two is additive inverse of negative two because two plus negative two is zero. Similarly, square root x plus one and negative square root x plus 1 will give you 0. x squared, negative x squared are additive inverses of each other. Negative f of x and f of x are additive inverses of each other. So here are a few examples of what additive inverse is. All right, take a look at <clears throat> 2 times negative 1. We're going to say 2 times negative 1, 2 copies of negative 1. So it's negative 1 plus negative 1 giving you a negative 2. Okay. So let's take a look. Another way you can visualize negative numbers is on the number line. So we have two copies of negative one. So we get negative one distance once and negative one distance twice. So when you're going negative one, you're going to the left. So in general then, look, one plus negative one times two is the same as zero times two because one and negative one are additive inverses of each other. So we have 0 times 2 is 0. So distributive property of multiplication over addition, we have 1 times 2 plus negative 1 times 2, which gives us 2 plus negative 1 times 2 equaling 0. What does that mean to you? Whatever the value of negative 1 times 2 is, that is going to be an additive inverse of 2 because they're adding up to 0. That was our definition of additive inverse. So what does that mean? We already know what's the additive inverse of 2. Do you remember? Oh, come on. What's the additive inverse of 2? We just did it right before. If not, rewind the video and go find what additive inverse of 2 is if you can't find the answer on your own. Yes, good, good, good. Yes, negative 2 is the additive inverse of 2. So negative 1 times 2 is how much then? Negative 2. Very good. So negative 1 times 2 has to be negative 2 because that's additive inverse of 2. So negative 1 times 2 is negative 2. Keep that in mind. All right. In general, then, negative 1 times a is the additive inverse of a, which is negative a. Similarly, a times negative 1 is also additive inverse of a or negative a. So we're observing that multiplying by a negative 1 always gives us the additive inverse. So we can also now conclude that negative a times negative b will become positive ab. All right, let's take a look at multiplicative inverse. So just like we had two numbers adding together giving you additive identity, we have additive inverses. So two, two numbers or objects multiplying together, giving you multiplicative identity will be a multiplicative inverses. So let's do four times a quarter. See how we can interpret that. We want four copies or four groups of one quarter. So take a look. So we have one quarter, and we have four of those. So one, two, three, and four. If you have 
four copies of a quarter added together, remember, repeated addition, then what are you going to get? You're going to get a whole, because that's my whole. A quarter makes, four quarters make a whole. Now let's look at interpretation of one quarter times four. So we have four apples here, and I want to take a quarter of that. So if I take a quarter of that, that will give me one apple, because I have four equal pieces, and I want a quarter of that. So that will be one apple. So one quarter times four is one. Let's take a look at formal definition then. If A is a non-zero mathematical object, then we're going to say B is multiplicative inverse of A, if and only if their product, product means multiplying them together, is the multiplicative identity. Which means that for our case, since 1 is our multiplicative identity, we want two things multiplying together, giving us 1. If that happens, then A and B are multiplicative inverses of each other. So for example, a fifth times 5 is 1. So 1 fifth is multiplicative inverse of 5. Similarly, 5 is multiplicative inverse of a fifth. 8 is multiplicative inverse of 1 eighth since 8 times 1 eighth equals 1. See if you can verify why 8 times 1 eighth should equal 1, or why a fifth times 5 should equal 1. Let's look at specific examples to understand the nature of what it is to say negative of something versus a number, a base raised to a negative power. So think of 0 as a gatekeeper for positive and negative numbers. All negative numbers stay to the left of 0, and all positive numbers stay to the right of 0. So it's almost like 0 is like watching guard over what numbers belong where, and making sure that all negatives live to one side, and positives live to the right side of it. So think of how we can imagine an imaginary wall right there. right? So here's an imaginary wall at 0, guarding its barriers. So here's number 3. So once you have 3, if I put a negative in front of it, then it no longer belongs on this side. In fact, it belongs to that side. And it passed right through the barrier because negatives belong to the left side of 0. So it was allowed to get over. You can take a look at 3 to the negative 1 power. So 3 is the base, negative 1 is the exponent. And that is similar to 1 over 3. So equivalent form of 3 to the negative 1 is 1 third. It does not cross the barrier. It has to stay on this side because it's still a positive number. Let's do a few more. What if I put a negative in front of that? Well, now it is on the right side of 0 to begin with. So putting a negative in front will have to go right through the barrier and go to the left side of 0. All right, let's try another one. What if I put a negative in front of the negative 3? Remember, putting a negative in front of the number makes additive inverse, so it belongs to the other side. So it will have to be going all the way past 0 to live on the right side of 0. So negative of negative 3 is 3. All right, let's take a look at 3 to the power negative 1 to the power negative 1. So this 1 third is 3 to the negative 1. But if I raise that to a negative 1 power, again, it's a positive number, and it's the same as 3. Let's take a look at another one here. So let's put a negative in front of this number here. So you have a negative of negative 3 to the power negative 1. Negative of that number means additive inverse, so it will have to shift over to the other side. So you can see how putting a negative in front of a number makes it go to the other side of 0, but negative exponent just moves it from numerator to denominator or denominator to numerator. So pause the video here and see what, where this number would belong if I put a negative in front of this number, 3 to the negative 1 to the negative 1 power. Yep, it will belong to the left side. So Basically, you can think of 0 as a gatekeeper that makes sure that negative numbers always sit to the left of it, and positive numbers sit to the right of it. 
So we would like you to now look at this example here. What we want you to do is see if you can write 5 in all the different ways possible. Negative of negative 5. Let's do the first one for you so you can see what we're talking about. So I can represent 5 as 5 to the negative 1 power to the negative 1 power or negative of negative 5. Those are all alternatives, equivalent forms of 5. So go ahead and do the same for all the remaining 3. Pause the video and see what you can do. So get at least two other representations. Assuming you have come back, 5 to the negative 1 is the same as 1 fifth. We can also say it's negative of negative 5 to the negative 1. We could have also said it's negative of negative 1 fifth. So many different ways. We're just giving you two ways here. Let's do this next one. So negative, negative of a number will make it positive and the negative 1 power makes it 1 over 5. We can also write that as 5 to the negative 1 power because that's also 1 fifth. When we have negative 5 to power negative 1, you'll end up with negative number 1 fifth, negative of 1 fifth, and here we have negative of 5 to the negative 1 power without the parentheses, but it's the same thing. So you can see how it pays dividends in understanding the notation if you just play with it and say, okay, how many different ways can I write a number in equivalent forms using all the different notations that we've learned? So negative on the outside of a real number moves it to the other side of zero. Negative exponent on the base of a real number moves that base from numerator to denominator or denominator to numerator, but keeps the number on the same side of zero as the original number. So let's do a short summary here. We have multiplying a mathematical object by its multiplicative inverse results in multiplicative identity one. Multiplicative inverse is the reciprocal of the object in other words, an object to power negative 1 is 1 over a, which is the reciprocal of a, and it will also be the multiplicative inverse of a. On the other hand, negative of a, which is negative 1 times a, is the additive inverse of a and sits on the other side from 0 that a sits on. So this is important because that way you will prevent from simplifying mistakes if you recognize this. So additive inverse have opposite signs and are symmetrically located on either side of zero. Multiplicative inverses have the same sign as the original number and sit on the same side of zero. Let's talk about distributive property of multiplication over subtraction. So what? see if you can pause the video here and draw a picture for what 3 times 6 minus 2 represents. Go ahead. Well, we know that 3 times 6 is going to be 3 rows of 6. But we're saying 3 rows of 6 minus the 2. 6 minus the 2. 6 minus the 2, 3 times. So 3 times 6 minus 2 will look like this. How many is that? That's 12, right? OK, so 3 times 6, which is 3 rows of 6. Do you see that? OK, and then what? We want to take away these two, right? So that means what? Take away 3 times 2. So that's 1, 2, 3. Three rows of 2 were taken out. So either way, you end up with 12. So 3 times 6 minus 2, that was you lay down a row of 6, take away 2. Lay down a row of 6, take away 2, and so on three times. Whereas here, you lay down three rows of 6 first, and then took away three rows of 2. Either way, you ended up with 12. So distribution of multiplication over subtraction does work. Multiplication distributes over subtraction and also addition. All right, let's take a look at 6 minus 2 times 3. So that's four rows of 3, basically. 
But if you do it the other way, you can also do 6 times 3, which is 6 rows of 3, and then take away 2 rows of 3. And same thing then. So you can see how answer will be 18 minus 6 or 12 again. And so distributive property of multiplication uh, would be a times b minus c is a b minus a c. And you can do the same in the other direction because of commutative property of multiplication. So multiplication distributes over subtraction. Whether you have two terms, three terms, four terms, does not matter. You just multiply each term, term by term. All right. All right, let's start with examples. Perform the operation, simplify this first one. 2 times negative 4x, how do you think we should do that? Two copies of negative 4 added together, giving you negative 8x. All right, think of this next problem in terms of true or false. If I have negative 2 times negative 4x, can I do this? Negative 2 times negative 4 and negative 2 times x. Is this a true statement or a false statement? Think about it. Pause the video, please. OK, you know, if you said true, that is not correct. This is a false statement. Why is that? Because think about negative 2 times negative 4x as additive inverse of 2 times negative 4x, which we just did right there. What's additive inverse of negative 8x is 8x. So negative 2 times negative 4x is 8x. Whereas what happens here? Negative 2 times negative 4 is 8. 8 times negative 2 is negative 16 times x, negative 16x. So multiplication does not distribute over multiplication. This is why we're making such a big deal about you remembering the whole words, not just distributive property, but distributive property of multiplication over addition, or distributive property of multiplication over subtraction. Just remember all of the words so that you do not have a chance to misuse the distributive property of multiplication over addition or subtraction. All right, simplify this and explain what properties you used. Go ahead. We'll discuss the answer in just a few seconds. All right, so we have negative 15x squared. Why? Because x times x is x squared. I can multiply the x's first using associative and commutative property of multiplications. And then 3 times negative 5, which is negative 5 plus negative 5 plus negative 5, 3 times, which would give me negative 15. So using commutative and associative property of multiplication, I can multiply these together. All right, so identify the property of real numbers that justify each equation. So here are all the properties that we've studied so far. Commutative property of addition, multiplication, and so on. OK, zero product property means if I multiply by zero, zero times a quantity is going to give me zero. We didn't explicitly discuss this, but that's what it means. So zero times a number is zero. OK, let's see. We'll put an equation here, and then you check the box of which property is being used. So I'll put the equation here, pause the video, and you find the check. You're multiplying by 0. So something times 0 is 0. What property is that? Well, that's the 0 property. All right, here's the next equation. Do it on your own. Half times 2 is 1. What property is that? 1 half times 2 is 1. 2 and 1 half are multiplicative inverses of each other. That's why you end up with 1. All right, do the next one on your own. Because when you add these two together, you end up with 0 because those two are additive inverses of each other. All right, try this one. 5 minus 0 is 5 because why? Because additive identity, good. 0 is additive identity. 5 times x plus y times x. What have we done? We've distributed multiplication over addition. 